Okay, Psalms 140. This psalm is titled to the chief musician, a psalm of David. The theme is similar to many of David's other songs, in which he cried out to God in a time of trouble. If you study David's life, he was in trouble a lot. Uh, the trouble seems to be slander against him. This could have been when he was a fugitive escaping from Saul. Uh, first three verses. Deliver me, O Lord, from evil men. Preserve me from violent men who plan evil things in their hearts. They continually gather together for war. They sharpen their tongues like a serpent. The poison of asps is under their lips. Selah. All right, so David just jumps right into this. Now, sometimes David kind of starts off and gets a little flowery in the beginning. He's just jumping right into business today. Deliver me, O Lord, from evil men. Often in David's life, he suffered under the presence and pressure of evil and violent men. This desperate song, this plea, shows his urgency by having no prelude, no praise up front. David went straight into his prayer need with God. He talks about those who plan evil things in their hearts. These evil men were known by the evil things in their hearts. Their evil actions were not accidents disconnected from their true nature. They were evil and they had planned to do evil. They planned to do evil to David specifically. He says they sharpen their tongues like a serpent. The desire for war and evil things is often expressed in sharp and poisonous words. David felt both the sting and the poison of such men and their words. And then, kind of almost out of place, David throws in a selah. Now, we've learned that that word means a pause. It, it could, you know, be a musical pause. It could be a pause for contemplation, but it was a pause. This is the first time we've seen Selah used since Psalm 89. From Psalm 90 all the way to Psalm 140, there are no Selahs. The term Selah is used in about 40 of the Psalms. Just an interesting phrase. It is a musical term. You know, if you were reading sheet music, it would be a pause. Uh, here it could be a pause for musical purposes. It could be a pause to allow you to reflect and think about what you've just sung. Verses 4 and 5, he continues his theme. Keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Preserve me from violent men who have purpose to make my steps stumble. The proud have hidden a snare for me and cords. They have spread a net by the wayside. They have set traps for me. Selah, another pause to think about. Now, David obviously is not unaware of what the enemy is trying to do to him. Uh, now, I don't know if they weren't attempting to be clever or God just gave David insight, but he was aware there were traps being set for him. So it starts off in verse 4. Keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked men. In the first portion of the psalm, David acknowledged the presence of wicked and violent men. With such a realistic view, he then requested God, preserve me from violent men. He talks about they have hidden a snare for me. They hope to make David trip over a series of hidden snares, cords, and traps, many of which were expressed in their poisonous words. David was not blind to the traps, but he had hope in God's help. David's enemies wished to snare him in his path of service. 
the way he usually led his life. Saul laid many different traps for David, but the Lord preserved him. Again, he ends these verses with a selah. David considered the danger coming from those who opposed him, and it prompted a thoughtful pause. Perhaps he's waiting for God to tell him how to avoid these traps. Verses 6 through 8. I said to the Lord, you are my God. Hear the voice of my supplication, O Lord. O Lord, the God, the strength of my salvation. You have covered my head in the day of battle. Do not grant, O Lord, the desires of the wicked. Do not further his wicked scheme, lest they be exalted. And he does it again. Selah. Pause and think about this. Think it through. Understand what's happening. So he tells God, you are my God. David would worship no other God. His allegiance was to God alone. This devotion gave him confidence that God would hear the voice of his supplications. Now there's a word we don't use very often. It just means prayer requests. I could say we're now going to have a time of praise and supplication. It, it would work. It sounds funny, but it would work. So just think of these as prayer requests. God doesn't just hear the words of David's cry. He listens to the voice. And I, I think what the author's trying to tell me here is he listens to the tone of voice. He listens to how it's being said. God not only sees the need, but he understands the heart, the, the tone of our voice, the, you know. You know, there's things I can say to you, and if, if I just write them out, they can mean three or four different things. You have to hear how I say it. God's listening to how David says it. He wants to know, this is like a heart-to-heart -heart connection between God and David. It says, you have covered my head in the day of battle. Uh, I, I, the picture of my mind is God handing David a hard hat. You can't get hit in the head. Uh, David knew many literal battles, but he also lived through battles with lying and slanderous men. David here gives testimony that God had been his protection, his shield, his armor, his head covering, his helmet, in those battles. He prays, do not grant, O Lord, the desires of the wicked. And recognizing who God was, David realized that if God were to help the wicked, then they would be exalted. He prayed for God to work for his people against the desires of the wicked. Now these folks who hated David hated the people that David led. They, he hated the true believers in God. Uh, I mean, these could actually have been folks who just hated Jewish people in general. God's going to protect them. And again, David puts in a sila. When he considered the need for the wicked to be stopped, it prompted him to just pause and reflect. I think on God's goodness, on God's strength, on God's ability. Now David's going to pray specifically about these wicked people, verses 9 through 11. As for the head of those who surround me, let the evil of their lips cover them. Let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire, into deep pits, that they rise not up again. Let not a slanderer be established in the earth. Let evil hunt down the violent man to overthrow him. Man, I wouldn't want to be one of David's enemies. If you considered that David had a connection to God and God listened to David's prayers, you don't want to be these guys that David's praying about. All right, as for the head of those who surround me. So we don't know the exact occasion in David's life for this prayer. So we don't know exactly what he meant by the head. It could have been Saul, who was David's long and persistent enemy. Could it be a man by the name of Doog? Uh, 
who was an evil, violent man who bore a false report against David in 1 Samuel. If this prayer is about Saul, it is another significant example of how David would not violently strike against Saul, even when he had the opportunity. Uh, we read that in 1 Samuel in seven, several places. David would not touch Saul for all his sins and faults. Saul was God's anointed king. When David was attacked by Saul, he would pour out his heart and prayer to the Lord, entrusting Saul's punishment to God, rather than taking it into his own hands. I have told you, you never want to attempt to get even. Get even. Let God fight your battles for you. God can do so much better job of protecting you than you can. David says, let the evil of their lips cover them. David prayed for simple justice in regards to his enemies. He prayed they will be covered with the same evil they had spoken against David and others. Now, under the new covenant, we are told not to return evil for evil. And we sympathize with David's cry for justice. Remember, David's still under the Old Testament. David's still eye for eye, truth for truth. He then prays, let burning coals fall upon them. David prayed that the same fire that the wicked men poured out on others will be poured out on them. He prayed this would destroy the wicked and that they will be hunted by the evil until they were overthrown. Let evil hunt the violent man, he says. These evil men hunted David in verses 4 through 6. David prayed the same would be turned to them, that the hunters would be hunted by their own evil. Verses 12 and 13. I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and justice for the poor. Surely the righteous shall give thanks to your name, the upright shall dwell in your presence. David remained confident that God would defend his afflicted people. This would mean justice for the poor and others who suffer from the words and works of wicked men. At the start of verse 12, David starts off, I know. He know it both because God promised it in the scriptures and he knew it by experience. Our Faith in God ought to be a combination of what we read in Scripture and what we have experienced in the past. Each time God takes care of us, each time God delivers us, each time God answers a prayer, it ought to strengthen and build our faith. We ought to be able to, when we're in a really bad place, instead of having a pity party, Instead of getting down in the dumps, we're going to be able to look back and say, look at all these other times I was in trouble, and God bailed me out each time. That ought to build our faith. That ought to keep us from that mountaintop and valley wobbling that so many of us do. The final verse of this psalm is an affirmation of faith. David is confident in the government of God. Evil men cannot continue. The afflicted will be delivered, and the righteous and upright will be perfectly vindicated. I wish I had that confidence in my government today. Sometimes I worry. Uh, okay, many talk as if the poor had no rights worth noticing, but they will sooner or later find out they are mistaken when the judge of the earth begins to deliver them. He closes with surely the righteous shall give thanks to your name. This psalm ends on a note of confidence. Although assaulted by the wicked, David put his trust in the Lord and gave all his desires for retribution unto him. David believed that in the end, the righteous would be thankful and the upright would dwell in your presence. The best reward of all. Psalm 140 begins in great trouble and sorrow, but ends in praise and triumph. You notice how often that's true in the Psalms? 
If sorrow is a certainty, so also is the action of God. Sorrow and darkness come to all of us on occasion, but only those who love God and trust in him can know what's going to work out in the end. God's going to have the final word. Amen. All right. Psalm 141. This psalm is titled, A Psalm of David. It shows David as a man of tender conscience who asked God to deal with his own sin and weakness first before addressing the wicked men who sought evil against him. It shows that David was even more concerned about evil inside himself than he was about evil from others. David understood that we are all sinners. We all have a sin nature. There is none righteous, no, not one. The so verses one and two. Lord, I cry out to you. Make haste to hear me. Give ear to my voice when I cry out to you. Let my prayer be set before you as incense. The lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Before I explain any of it, just as you listen to it, does it sound like David is confident that God's listening to him? That God's going to hear him and take care of him? Right. Part of what I really enjoy out of the Psalms is watching the heart to heart connection between the Psalm writer and God. So it says, Lord, I cry out to you. Make haste to hear me. David's need was urgent. By the way, David's needs was always urgent. So he directed his prayer to the true and living God and begged him to help him with haste. It's okay to ask God to do it now. He may not answer that way, but it's okay to ask. He says, give ear to my voice. <coughs> when a child cries out to a parent, the parent hears not only the words, but the voice of the cry. We talked about this in the last song. It, it's listening to the tone, to the intent. I, I can say something to my kids or my grandkids. And, you know, the words, can, you know, if I just wrote it out, you, you wouldn't know what I was really saying. But if you heard my tone of voice, you read my body language, you would certainly know what the message is. God is reading David's body language. He's reading his prayer language to understand. So he, is, he hears not only the words, but he hears the, our heart, but the, the real us. David then prays, let my prayer be set before you as incense. David used the smoke and smell of incense as a representation of his prayer to God. He described his posture in prayer. He lifted up his hands. Remember I told you that was not invented by the Pentecostal church. We were lifting up hands long before there was a Pentecostal church. It's just something God told us to do. David was talking about the evening sacrifice that was a gift to God. Revelation chapter 5 says that the prayers of God's people are like incense. Hebrews chapter 13 describes prayer and praise as a sacrifice to God. Prayer rises to heaven even as the smoke of incense rises upward. Prayer pleases God even as incense is a pleasing smell. So David's trying to do this word picture thing here for us as he's writing. If David wrote this psalm while a fugitive from King Saul, then the ideas of incense and evening evening sacrifice had a special meaning to him. He couldn't go to Jerusalem. He was a hunted man. He couldn't go to the temple and offer prayer and praise and sacrifice in the temple. We'll find in the next psalm he's probably doing it from a cave. But he wasn't going to be disconnected from God. He was still going to communicate with God. All right. Verses 3 and 4. Set a God, O Lord, over my mouth. 
Keep watch over the door of my lips. Do not incline my heart to any evil thing, to practice wicked works with men who work iniquity. And do not let me eat of their delicacies. So David was concerned that God would help him watch what came out of his mouth. You know, so often as a Christian, we have good intents. But something happens and we bristle up and we open our mouth and stuff comes out before we pray about what we're about to say. And it usually is dishonoring to us and to God both. David didn't want the same mouth that he prayed with that was going to be like incense before God to speak evil things, to speak corrupt things, to speak lies. He didn't want to say anything that he shouldn't. He then prays in verse 4, Do not incline my heart to the evil thing. David knew that it was more than his lips that needed protection. His heart could also be affected by evil things, which would result in evil works. This was David's way of praying what Jesus later taught us to pray, lead us not into temptation. Right. David also understood the reality of how we work. If you can step back from yourself, maybe get a little bit higher so you can look down on yourself and your life and honestly evaluate how you work, how you function we would recognize the truth is that sin starts here before we ever commit sin. We start by thinking about it. We start by mulling it over in our mind. And if we don't catch ourselves right there, we don't stop ourselves there, eventually we will do the things we're thinking about. Uh, the New Testament tells us to bring every thought into captivity. The Pastor John concordance or commentary on that verse says, learn to think about what you're thinking about. Okay, folks, we're responsible for what goes on up here. Our brain does not run on autopilot. Now, things pop in there. Some things that pop in there are put there by God. Some things that pop in there are put there by the enemy. Okay? I'm not held guilty in God's eyes because I have a bad thought in my head. God looks at me and says I'm guilty if I start to play with that thought. I start to mull it over. I start to, how can I do that and get away with it? That's where we get in trouble. We get the, the minute the bad thought gets planted, that God, I recognize that thought's not for you, get it out of my head. That will keep us out of trouble. So he didn't want to say anything wrong. He didn't want to think anything wrong. And then he gives some real wisdom. Do not let me eat of their delicacies. David didn't want to walk in the ways of the men who work iniquity. So he also didn't want to eat at their table. Now this was probably a literal situation for David. But the principle is there. We ought not to be warming ourselves at the enemy's fire. We ought not to be feeding ourselves at the enemy's buffet. I don't care how free the buffet is, I don't care how good the food is, we ought not to be hanging out with the wrong crowd, even if lunch is free. By the way, if nobody ever told you, nothing is free. Everything costs. All right, I'm gonna read the first part of verse five. Verse five is a long verse. I'm going to split it into two parts. So the first part of verse 5 I'm going to read. Let the righteous strike me. It shall be a kindness. And let him rebuke me. It shall be as excellent oil. Let my head not refuse it. So David was going to reject the delicacies of the wicked. But he is willing to bear correction from the righteous. He recognized that if a righteous person tried to correct him, it would be a kindness to him. 
David says it should be as excellent oil. That does not mean it's expensive synthetic motor oil to put in your engine. It meant a highly refined oil. It was the type of oil used to anoint the head. It was a perfumed oil. So you went to somebody's house and they might take their finger and put a little drop of oil on your head. It would smell nice. It might cover up your body odor, but it was just a gesture of hospitality. But it was done with the very best grade of oil. So that's what he's talking about with this excellent oil. All right, the rest of verse five through verse seven. Oh, this oil was used when you had special company, somebody you wanted to honor, show respect for. All right, rest of verse five through verse seven. But still my prayer is against the deeds of the wicked. Their judges are overthrown by the sides of the cliff. And they hear my words, but they are sweet. Our bones are scattered at the mouth of the cave, of the grave. And when one plows, as when one plows and breaks up the earth. All right, so David is still praying against the deeds of the wicked. Uh, he prayed for God to work against the wicked. David wanted to see wicked judges be overthrown by the sides of the cliff. If you're picturing in your mind that what David wanted to do was see wicked judges tossed over the side of the cliff, that's exactly the right picture. That's what David was saying. Uh, David loved God's word. David hated those guys doing false judgments. David hated those judges that were taking bribes and corrupting God's word. So they hear my words for they are sweet. The death of Saul made all the rest of the nation look to the son of Jesse, David, as the Lord's anointed. And at that point, his words became sweet to them. This was like a prophecy that got fulfilled. Now, the next part I'm going to have trouble explaining to you. It's okay. All the commentators I read had the same problem. Our bones are scattered at the mouth of the grave. The phrase is difficult to understand in the original language. Perhaps David used this word picture to describe how ruined he felt so that he could only cry out to God for help. It's unclear. All of the commentators were struggling to give a meaning. So sometimes I can't decipher for you completely if I don't have something to work off of. I don't on that particular verse. Verses 8 through 10. My eyes are upon you, O God the Lord. In you I take refuge. Refuge. Do not leave my soul destitute. Keep me from the snares. Remember we talked about snares and traps a little while ago? Keep me from the snares they have laid for me and from the traps of the workers of iniquity. Let the wicked fall into their own nets will I escape safely? Well, there's God taking care of him. Escaping safely. So, David says his eyes are upon the Lord. Even in his terrible condition, David deliberately set his eyes upon the Lord. Because God himself was David's refuge. David prayed, do not leave my soul destitute. What he had in mind was without God's protection, without God's mercy. David knew he couldn't accomplish anything without God's help, and neither can we. He then prays, keep me from the snares they have laid for me. The enemies of David were determined to destroy him. So they set many snares, traps, and nets for him. David's prayer was that they would fall into their own nets even as he would escape safely. David's trust in God was repeatedly vindicated as those who sought to destroy them were themselves destroyed. David ends up by saying, well, I escape safely. David had escaped many times. He remembered that. 
He saw it God's hand in it. He knew that it was God's help that allowed him to do that. It's amazing as you read through scripture how many times people literally just walk out of trouble because God is with them. Uh, in John on Wednesday nights, we've seen Jesus over and over just walk through the crowd. It was, it was a lynch mob. Jesus just walked through somehow. God has ways of delivering us that we don't understand, that don't make sense. The good news is they don't have to make sense. We just have to know we serve a God that can do that. Amen. I don't have to know how God does it. Folks, my brain ain't that big. I just have to know God loves me. God's going to protect me. God's going to deliver me. That's all that counts. And by the way, what's the worst that can happen to me? I go home to heaven early. You know, I, I don't lose either way. All right. Psalm 142. Let's see if I can, depending on your Bible, we may come up with a word that you don't recognize. Psalm 148. Psalm 142 is titled, A Contemplation of David, <clears throat> a prayer when he was in the cave. So we know that this is taking place in a cave. Now, your Bible may use the term a masculine of David. Masculine just means contemplation. Probably a better translation for either word would be instruction. So he calls this prayer a masculine. In David's mind, a psalm of instruction because of the good lessons he had learned while in the cave. Lessons he learned while on his knees in the cave. Lessons he desired to share with others. Now this cave was probably what was referred to as the Adullam Cave. You find that mentioned in 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 1. This would suggest that Psalms 34 and Psalms 57 were also associated with this period in David's life. So let's get into David praying in the cave. This is another one of those Psalms where he just jumps right into it. I cry out to the Lord with my voice. With my voice to the Lord, I make my supplication. And the supplication is just a prayer request. Notice he's repeated the same idea twice. Remember Hebrew poetry rule is things don't rhyme. You bring emphasis by repetition. So David is doing this to draw attention. I cry out to the Lord. This was more than David's appeal for help. It was also his declaration of allegiance to the God of Israel. David